Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall. And today, be excited because we have another round table. And this time it's talking about resensitization phases, low volume phases, volume ramping, and changing volume and manipulating it, and whether or not it's superior hypertrophy in the long run. We have Mena Hentelmans, James Krieger, and Dr. Mike on the show discussing this. So definitely sink your teeth into it. And if you're interested about utilizing a low volume phase, I definitely recommend you check out our Primer Phase ebook, which tells you how to actually construct this and how you might want to use it and some of our thoughts and rationale behind it. So guys, without further ado, let's get into the recording. Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today we have a roundtable. I can't remember the last roundtable we had on here, but this is going to be a fun one. So I have Mena Henselmans, Mike Isratel, and James Krieger on the show, and I'm very excited to dig into this quite, I guess, niche topic, but maybe uh, one that's kind of grown in more relevance over recent time, and that is essentially programming for hypertrophy the use of maybe volume ramps and cycling, lower volume periods, higher volume periods, uh, in terms of probably set number is what we're going to be talking about, or even also maintenance periods. So you might have heard these referred to as kind of resensitization periods. Primer phases is something I've also coined the term. And uh, various kind of iterances of these have been used amongst some of these guys and maybe not amongst other ones. And so I thought we'd just dig into the topic because I think it's always nice to have three smart minds on the podcast kind of digging into some of these like very gritty, nitty gritty topics. So uh, I don't know if we want to start with Mike uh, kind of just talking about your current application of such a kind of low volume maintenance phase within kind of application for optimal hypertrophy. Um, I think you were probably the person I kind of really started thinking about them more deeply due to your work. Uh, but I think you've also potentially developed your own thoughts past where they were when we first chatted about them. And uh, we can kind of update those today. Is that all right? Totally. Um... Hello to Menno and James. Always a pleasure. On guard. This is a debate. Is this a debate or a roundtable? Is a roundtable debate? <laughs> it's a fight. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. It's war. I'll take Menno in the first round and opt out from James Krieger in the second. I don't <laughs> want to die. Um, all right. So I think there's a, like sort of at least two things to talk about here, which are related, but not exactly the same. Um, I think there's the volume ramping idea, and then there's the idea of doing the low volume phases for resensitization. So just real quick on volume ramping. To me, volume ramping comes uh, not from a top-down perspective of we'd like to do this to get better results. To me, it comes from a bottom-up perspective of if we try with an, a program we're not accustomed to, different set and rep schemes, different exercises, switching from a fat loss phase to a muscle gain phase, Anytime you make some big changes, and especially after a deload week where your fatigue is low, you uh, just don't need as much volume as maybe sometimes the case to do a good job. And if you want to do more volume than that, you actually end up causing a lot more muscle damage than necessary. And some of that damage may take away from growth. So for example, if at the end of the last mesocycle, you were up to eight sets on the leg press. And that was what was giving you a really good results, but was just barely within your ability to recover. After you deload and let's say you switch to hack squats, you know, eight sets of hack squats on that first day is just going to leave you really crippled. It's going to interfere with your ability to continue to have good workouts later that week and even weeks down the line. But it's also uh, something that's going to present so much muscle damage that it's uh, by research confirmation, at least in, in theoretical terms, could dip into your potential for growth. So maybe instead of just going to eight sets of hack squats right away, you do something like it, at most six sets, maybe even three to four sets of hack squats. I have more fine detailed ways to figure out how much volume you need there that are that are more auto-regulatory. But in any case, there's a good theoretical basis for like, you just don't need that much and doing that much is like a bit overkill. So then once you're in that position in week one of a mesocycle where you're like, maybe let's say doing four sets of hack squats, is four sets going to be the optimal volume? Well, your ability to recover from a known stimulus as you're exposed over and over to that stimulus increases pretty dramatically, more quickly than your strength and 
and your muscle size do. So if four sets of hack squats makes you so sore that you barely recover for your next squad workout on the first week, it's unlikely to do that on the second week and really unlikely to do that in the third and fourth weeks. And you'll be able to recover much better. And because we know theoretically more volume leads to more growth, generally, if you can recover from it, there's more specific things to say on that, that, you know, once you're easily able to recover from four sets of hack squats, there's probably a good reason to maybe try doing five and then maybe six and then maybe seven. And then when you, you reach the end of the mesocycle, you can't push anything any further. The cumulative fatigue is too high. You deload and then you can repeat that mesocycle, maybe starting with six or seven sets of hack squats instead of eight. Uh, or you can switch exercises again and let's say do front squats or high bar squats or something and then go back down to four or five sets to repeat that process again. So that's how I would say volume cycling works in my at least one way to look at it the way I do. And then I think after months and months and months of doing that kind of volume cycling with different exercises and everything, I think a couple of things happen. One, your um, muscular is deep, sort of deep chemical response to hypertrophy may be somewhat muted. That muting generally corresponds to fatigue. And I think a week or two of much lower volume training, like a dealer and an active rest, can, can get almost all of that out. However, there are at least two other concerns that I have. One is joint and connective tissue disruption from months and months of hard training may require more than one to two weeks to really heal, not completely, but to a, a, a high extent, such that another three or four months of hard training is possible. And also, I would say psychology plays in there, really pushing your pedal to the metal, even with deloads and volume cycling for months and months and months, I think can psychologically demand maybe more than one to two weeks of taking it easy, maybe like three or four weeks of taking it easy, not all the time, maybe once a year, maybe once every two years or something like that. And especially if the nutritional phase is concordant, which is to say, if you're in a maintenance phase anyway, nutritionally, because we all know that you can only sort of go on so many muscle gain and fat gain phases, sometimes a maintenance phase is a good idea. If you're on maintenance phase anyway, you know, there's really not, not a very compelling reason to push the volume and intensity super high because you're not even supplying the requisite calories to get a lot of growth out of that. So when you're on a maintenance phase anyway, you might as well uh, put that with very low training volumes just enough to keep the muscle on, but also enough to promote a ton of psychological healing and uh, joint connective tissue healing and physiological resensitization of cellular growth pathways, such that when you're done with that two to four week period of low volume, gee, I mean, you're so ready and set to make tons of great gains on every level. How little of training we do in that period is actually something I would just defer straight to James Kriegerog because he's the expert on the state of the literature at the time. Last I checked, I'll just say this, surprisingly low somewhere between one third and one ninth, the typical volume that you see causing the best gains. As one ninth is kind of fantasy land volume. I will say I've played on the higher and lower ends of that over the last several years. And I've done it with friends and people that I coach. And it turns out like I'm at least willing to stamp my shit on one sixth. Like it's such a tiny amount of volume that keeps your muscle where it is. And because you can regain muscle very rapidly upon the reintroduction of hard training, even if you dip a little bit below maintenance, the benefits of that psychological and physiological and anatomical resensitization may outweigh the slight decrement in muscle, which you get back in the first two weeks anyway. So that's how I see it. It comes from a needs basis that I don't think there should be a top down, like you need a maintenance phase now, but like, you know, when your body starts to give out on you and your mind starts to give out, maybe a low volume phase is a good idea. And then volume ramping, I just think it's just how you do smart training. We ramp loads, we ramp reps. Why don't we ramp volumes? A lot of the similar constraints apply. Uh, fantastic i think i'll probably go over to james now because i think at least you have quite a similar methodology to mike uh, i stole all my shit from james so <laughs> hopefully if mine's different i gotta rewrite it <laughs> do you do you come at the volume from the same perspective uh, pretty much i mean i mean my my mind on volume has changed you know so much over the years you know i mean you know, I mean, I started out several years ago as kind of a low volume HIT type guy. And then I kind of turned it over. Okay, well, I thought more volume was better. And then I would move to the typical, well, I think you got to do, you know, 10 to 20 sets per week, you know, or whatever. And then, you know, the study came out with Brad. Um, and, you know, I started thinking, well, maybe, maybe you can do even more volume. But then I kind of started seeing a pattern that the some studies showed that, some didn't, and the studies that showed that seemed to use you know, like really low rest intervals, so um, or really short rest intervals. So I started thinking that okay, well, you know, some of these studies that 
show that you can do up to you know 40 some weekly sets it's probably just because they're using such short rest intervals there's not you know if you're using a lot long rest intervals you don't really necessarily need to get that um so then um i think the study that influenced me the most was actually published not too long ago just a year or two ago i want to say um was and I don't remember the author's names, but basically it was a within subject design and they had uh, um, subjects, it was unilateral training and you know one one leg they trained uh, basically I think it was just a flat 20 sets a week or something like that. And the other the other leg they trained, they took what the, the people had been previously doing and basically just bumped their volume up by like I think it was 20% or something. And they found that the leg that just bumped the volume up, did better than the leg that just had the straight the straight volume and there were some guys that went from you know 30 they were already doing 30 sets and they went to like you know 34 or 33 or whatever and they started doing better you know so they were way above that typical you know 10 to 20 range or whatever um but then there were some people that went from 12 to 14 or whatever and did good and and so uh, that study really started to make me think about all the other re volume research. And I started thinking that the problem with, I would say the vast majority of volume research and including, you know, the studies I've worked on with Brad and stuff like that, they're not really measuring the impacts of volume per se, they're measuring the impacts of changes in volume. Because, you know, if you're taking a bunch of recreationally trained people you know, who, who obviously are training um, and you put them on, let's say, a low, medium and high volume program, you know, you'd randomly allocate them. Chances are a lot of those people that you put on the low volume program are actually probably moving from a higher volume now to a lower volume program. So you may just be putting those people on maintenance, which kind of gives the low volume a little bit of an unfair shake, I would say. Um, and so now, honestly, I kind of just see volume kind of similar to what Mike was saying, just as a form of progressive overload. It's just, you know, no different from adding weight. Um, I kind of see it as a form of progressive overload. And you increase, you know, when you hit plateaus, you increase volume to get more gains. And eventually you'll hit, hit some volume where further increases in volume aren't going to get you any more gains. And that might be very similar to Mike's concept of a max recoverable, you know, volume or, or something like that. And I say, then that's the point where, okay, well, what do you do? You can't just, you know, obviously further increases in volume aren't working. You can't increase weight anymore. What are you going to do? Well, I think the only, the only option you have is to basically now, you know, either deload or, you know, reduce your training volume for a period of time. Um, and then start the whole process again. And, and so um, that's really where my thinking is now. I don't think there's any magical number of sets that you need to do. Um, I think it's super individual. Um, and it's also probably gonna vary with any, within any particular individual over time. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of where my thinking is now, you know, along those lines, so. Cool. And that sounds very similar to kind of Mike's kind of bringing volume up, deloading, <clears throat> kind of rinsing, repeating. Do you also, after a number of those, implement like a extended period of time at lower volume? Is that something you're a, f a fan of? I mean, I, I think so. I don't. I mean, I don't know if there's any set formula for it. I mean, I think it's it's going to be highly individual. Again, yeah. um, uh, you know how advanced the person is, uh, you know, things like, again, you know, Mike mentioned joints and stuff. Like, I mean, you know, if you're, you're having joint issues or whatever, you may need to do more extended period of time. Um, but I don't think there's any magical formula where well, it's gotta be a certain, a certain time frame. I think it's, you know, again, I think it's really going to be de dependent on, on, uh, on individual circumstances. So. Yeah, I guess level of advancement, uh, how serious someone is if they have holidays all the time they're kind of getting those life resensitizations or something so uh what that that sounds smart to me and i think probably the point of difference is going to come from menno uh because i believe you're less fond of maybe volume ramping and also maintenance phases in general so i'd be interested to know your perspective menno yeah i'd say overall um 
I very much follow Mike's perspective on, on volume ramping, but crucial difference over a much longer time period. So not week to week, but more over the course of months than figuring out sort of where the optimal volume is. So I think one key thing um, for my philosophy is that a certain muscle, when it's in a certain state, has a certain optimal stimulus. Like physically, there has to be something which is, includes a certain amount of volume that makes it grow at an optimal level. And the question is, does this stimulus change much over time? Now, I think if the muscle's not changing, the stimulus is also not going to change much. And most research in various lines, because there are a lot of different topics we touch on here with, with deloads, volume ramping, uh, resensitization, uh, does prior volume influence a reaction to subsequent volume? I think most of that, if you look at like the block periodization literature, for example, uh, and in general, most studies find that on a given total amount of work, you're going to get similar results, regardless of how you distribute that work over time, either within the workout, between workouts, over phases, whatever. It's basically like energy balance to a large extent, where the total amount of volume you put in over a certain amount of time period is by and large the number one factor. Now, other things... And other measures mainly influence our results because they influence the total amount of volume. So that, that study that James mentioned is, is a very interesting one. I was, uh, I'm a little skeptical of it because you have two groups doing sort of the same volume and one group had better gains. And it, this study doesn't necessarily mean that the prior volume is what influences the results because it can also simply mean that people have some idea of what their optimal volume is. And most people are probably erring on the side of undertraining rather than overtraining. So if you take their prior volume and you're going to add some to that, you're more likely to be closer to the optimum rather than if you pull some number out of thin air. If anything, at least you're going to probably get a more homogeneous response. So you have more reliable results. Whereas if you decrease volume, there are some people that probably, I think very few people are going to significantly overtrain intuitively. So for most people, probably, if they're recreationally trained to the gym, you're going to decrease their volume. It's very likely, or it's very unlikely that you're going to end up at the optimal volume. It's more likely that they need to increase volume. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the prior volume per se. It just means that it's a different method to get an estimate closer to optimum than just picking a number. It's also you know, one study compared to many other studies along these lines. Um, the literature on this is like, there are very different topics. Uh, and like I said, the general trend is that you just have the total volume. Like for example, there is actually a, a study that looked at increasing the volume over time versus going all in. And then you see that the people that go all in, they have much more soreness in the initial weeks. And the people that ramp up the volume had almost no soreness over the course of the whole study. But given the same total volume over the study as a whole, their gains were also the same. Uh, most research also finds that training through soreness is something you can do quite safely and doesn't really, and it's actually possibly the best way to get rid of it. Uh, although you definitely want to avoid excess muscle damage and to a very limited extent, soreness is an indication of muscle damage. So uh, I would definitely say it's not a good idea if you went from zero to go up to eight sets per muscle group at once. So that, there probably has to be some, some gradual introduction there, especially if it's somewhere longer time off period. But to do it very gradually all the time, uh, I'm not a big fan of. Roughly with uh, deloads, there have been, um, at least for the purpose of resensitization specifically, I don't think it, it pans out. There have been a few studies, including a recent one from uh, this year, even this month or one month ago, I think. And the first one was 2007 or something, Kutz, however you pronounce it. And then there were two blood flow restriction studies that had a deload week, and now there's the new one. And the new one and the Kutz both found that if you ramp up volume very significantly over the course of a training program and then you take a week off, there's no muscle growth. And then the only studies that actually um, demonstrate that functional overreaching, as it's sometimes called, like you basically have a period where you ramp up the volume a lot and then you you intentionally overreach, right? That's, that's actually quite different from necessarily what, what Mike's doing which I don't think typically involves active overreaching where you're actually getting weaker. And then 
you take some time off. And uh, blood flow restriction studies, I think there's two of them, you do actually see that, uh, or at least one of them, I'm not sure. There's, they actually do keep growing, but they actually decreased in strength and uh, even in, in muscle size by some measures during the training program, which was also quite short. And they were training twice a day most days, I think even, and they were not very well trained. So it was massive overkill during the training program. And then basically when they compared this to similar designs where they just kept training, they found that it wasn't necessarily that you're, you're making gains and then there's this extra bit of gains at the end, but it was more that you're losing gains basically, and you're going back up to baseline in the end. So it's more like at best delaying gains. And I think Kutz also found that they just went back to baseline. They didn't really super compensate, which is the idea that you have some extended um, overreaching periods or where you sort of dig yourself deeper into a recovery hole. And then you come out of that with a, a massive surge of gains, basically. I also think anecdotally, it doesn't really pan out because, you know, how, wh when do you really see someone make more than, say, one increment of weight worth of gains across sessions? That's almost never happens, right? It's you never see someone do, um, th let's say their their squat is 140 kilos, and then for they do a deload or <laughs> even whatever they do next week they're at 150, right? That's this. It, it almost never happens. At best, you're going to be at, say, 142 and a half. You're at one increment of gain. And then it's questionable, was that really deload necessarily, or could you just have kept training and also gained that amount of strength? Uh, other reasons to deload, I think, make more sense. But I'm more a fan of reactive deloading because the two main critiques I have of sort of the traditional deload week is that, uh, one, it's, it's proactive, which sounds good, but it also means that you have to sort of guesstimate when you need it, which doesn't necessarily pan out. Like you don't know when you have poor sleep or higher stress levels than normal. If you have a client, you don't know when they're not going to adhere to the program, when their protein intake may be subpar, for example, and they actually need a deload. Of course, you can, you can estimate it if you're ramping up volume to a certain level. It's more likely that they need it at the end than in between, but in between, they may also have periods where they actually need some form of deloading. And two, it's whole body. So for injury management, for example, I think there are a lot of good ways to, to manage injuries that are more effective than, than rest. Rest itself actually is very ineffective as a healing method for most uh, connective tissue because blood flow to tendons and connective tissue is very low compared to muscle at rest. And active recovery in research is something that has actually been found to help significantly. So then I'd be much more fan of uh, a lower volume of uh, training rather than complete time off. Plus, you want to do it on a body part specific basis. So many people have weak joints and strong joints. And for, for example, for myself, I basically never need to deload my hips. Like I, I almost never have any hip problems, but my elbows and knees are very susceptible to injury. So they definitely need a lot more um, like high reps, control tempo, I have to be much more careful with exercise selection, rotate through different exercises more often. Whereas for Many exercises like Romanian deadlifts, I can just do it, keep doing heavy nonstop year round without any issues. But so overall, I'm more fan of this is the program and we're going to adapt it to your progression. But as soon as, as long as everything's good, don't fix what isn't broken. Hey, Pascal here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. Cool. Thank you, Benno. And I think <clears throat> I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, Mike, on kind of the idea, and Benno, do jump in if I've got this wrong, but essentially kind of the average volume is what's going to dictate progress more or less versus kind of being if you're higher you're kind of low and high meet in the middle average is probably like equivocal whether or not you start at kind of you ramp it up and come down so long as the average is there or thereabouts uh, for an individual it's going to lead to mostly the same results and anything that's kind of gained through a resensitization period is maybe down to maybe losing something during that period of time whereas you could have just kind of kept going and so again it's kind of almost equivocal whether or not you're getting anything from that is that fair Menno? first of all yeah basically i, I would note that specifically volume ramping on a short-term basis there's almost no research i think no research in fact on that 
So we do have good research on deload week with deload weeks with overreaching periods, but there are, to my knowledge, no good studies that directly compare a volume ramping in the sense that Mike, for example, would do it or just described compared to just constant um, total work equated program, just constant training, keep at that and we'll see yeah. who makes the better gains. Cool. Yeah. How'd you feel, Mike? All good points, all very not good feel. points. <laughs> so um, I think that if I was to make a prediction, I would say that given any average volume for a whole mesocycle, I said the average volume is the most important determining factor of the magnitude of gains and how you structure that volume is significantly less important. I would say this is similar to like total macros versus nutrient timing. Um, uh, that being said, I think nutrient timing does have an effect. It's just smaller. And I think that volume ramping uh, or how you organize your volume through the mesocycle probably also has an effect. It's just not that big. So I'd also say, what I would describe that I'm a proponent of, I wouldn't describe as volume ramping. I, was I would describe as vol uh, volume auto-regulation. So you sort of try to anticipate a scenario where every training session is ultra high quality before you even start your muscle cycle. What does ultra high quality mean? It means that you are supplying a sufficient amount of volume to get some sort of indication that you're going to be getting some growth. So you should be feeling significantly weaker in the muscle group after training is done. You should probably have some sort of pump. Like if you don't have any pump and you don't feel any weaker, it's not really clear you did anything to the muscle and there's probably no impetus for it to grow. Also, we know that while overlapping soreness in an acute sense is probably not a big deal, I'd say chronic overlapping soreness is probably not the ideal way to promote recovery and growth. And I would say that if you ideally can no longer be sore by the time you train a muscle hard again, you can train it the hardest possible, have the best mind-muscle connection, get the best tension, and probably get the most growth, and so on and so on and so on. And we also know this, that the directly muscle damage does impede hypertrophic outcomes, and that while delayed onset soreness is not perfectly correlated with muscle damage, there is absolutely some kind of relationship, and especially a good relationship with the extremes. If you're a little bit sore, can we say you're ultra damaged? Probably not. If you're ultra super mega sore and you can barely bend your legs, I would say that you're probably muscle damage is not uh, close to zero and you're probably paying some kind of price. If, if anything, when you're ultra super psychotic sore, it's going to be difficult for you to train very hard uh, because you you got to match or beat your previous week's efforts. And yeah, man, when you're really sore, that's really hard. And also, I'm fully inclined to believe that soreness probably does increase injury risk, uh, just marginally, but enough for us to not want to put ourselves in a situation where we have to train psychotically sore all the time. So... If we want good workouts that are sufficiently stimulative and not overly taxing, we're gonna to wanna to pre-plan those ahead of time before we start. So if I talk to someone about making their plan and I ask them, you know, how many, you took a deload week last week. They say, yeah, I'm pretty fresh, a little bit out of shape in that case, right? And they, you know, typically they say they do 10 sets of quads per leg workout or something like that, just to keep it a nice round number, nice and simple to work with. You know, if, if they typically do 10, or if they last mesocycle did 10 quad sets every single session that they did it, I would say after a deload week and maybe changing their quad exercises, my best guess is 10 would actually net just a bit more soreness than we want. And it was sure as hell send some growth stimulus, but maybe like the, the ratio of damage to growth stimulus is not ideal. So maybe what I would say is, hey, let's start out with like seven or eight sets and see how you feel. And there's ways to auto-regulate auto within the session. So you're doing the sets, if you get a gnarly mind-bending pump and your muscle is absolutely drained, I'm personally of the opinion that you should just leave the gym because there's nothing more to be done that's going to be beneficial. Uh, I know people who have trained with such high volumes that they get a pump in their chest and then an exercise later, they start losing the pump and then they do another exercise after that. That to me is completely insane. It probably does way too much damage to do anything very good. Sure, it will result in muscle growth. I don't think it's optimal muscle growth. And furthermore, because I think higher frequency training is probably marginally more effective than lower frequency. I don't ever like to see people do such an insane amount of volume that takes them a week to recover. I prefer half a week, maybe even a third of a week. So we put someone into that paradigm. All of a sudden we say we guessed seven sets and let's say we were correct. They get nice and sore, great pump, great workout, great mind muscle connection, tons of tonnage moved, everything's going well. The next week that they repeat that similar workout, are we betting that seven is still going to be the right answer? Well, maybe. 
but we, we know that the human body adapts very quickly in recovery and work capacity. It doesn't adapt recovery work capacity over the course uh, of months. It does that too, but it actually adapts pretty rapidly week to week, especially if you're dealing with novelty, which after deload by definition you are, and especially if you're changing the exercises, that's a lot of novelty. So in week two of that same program, seven sets of hack squats in the first week, maybe something like eight or nine sets of hack squats will check all those same boxes that seven checked in the first week. But maybe it's just seven. So we sort of plan to do seven and see how we feel. You do seven sets of squats and you look at your legs like they're pretty pumped, not as pumped as last week. I know I got sore enough last week to heal on time. So if I'm this not so responsive, I can certainly do a few more sets and get just the same amount of sore, make sure I don't overlap. So maybe you do eight or nine. Now there is a situation in which if your RIRs are falling, your relative effort is increasing week to week to week. And of course you're putting more load or more reps on the bar, each set that you do every week, and also one more thing, your mind-muscle connection and technique on that exercise becomes better. You can actually get more out of every single set and rep. What ends up happening is you may reach week three and you actually just do seven or eight sets the same as, as you did last week, but because the load is higher, because the relative effort is greater, because you're better at the exercise and better at recruiting muscles, you may not need any more than seven or eight, and you just cap it. And I think that's to Meadow's point of like, when you lock something into an effective pattern, just keep going. So I'd say if you're getting great pumps, you're healing soreness on time, and there's no obvious impetus to increase the volume, I wouldn't increase the volume. Typically, the way I actually train in real life is if I have, let's say, a six-week progression, it's pretty low volume in week one, much higher volume in week two, maybe a little higher the same in week three and four and five. In week six, I'll maybe I'll bump the volume or maybe I'll keep it the same. So it's kind of an intro ramp and potentially a little exclamation mark at the top. The only reason to do the exclamation mark at the top before the, the deload is because there's theoretically some benefit to doing even a little bit more than you can continuously recover from. You don't have to worry about accumulated fatigue anymore. So I don't have to worry about next week. I won't be able to repeat this. Doesn't matter. I just do a real good job this week and I can deload next week and no problem. That doesn't actually suppose that we're doing functional overreaching. We're just doing the best job we can knowing we don't have to pay the price. It's kind of like, you know, if you have to walk home after a night of drinking, you might be looking at that last shot and be like, fuck that. I still have to function. But if you're getting a ride, fuck it, pull the shot back. You're going to have more fun. Maybe you'll throw up in someone's car, but who cares? That's what friends are for. So the way I see it is you essentially, in every mesocycle, you err on the side of let's not kill ourselves up front because we don't want cumulative fatigue to rise too high. This is something we have to deal with later. Err a little bit on the side of easy, then auto-regulate your way to great workouts. And as the workouts, if they are too much, you pull sets away. If they're not enough, you can add sets, but there needs to be an impetus to do that, a good, good reason. So for example, if I did three chest presses last week and three this week, last week it was great, but this week it was like, I barely got a pump. I feel like I'm just warming up. It's kind of like practice. Like I can do more. I know I can. And I know I can fucking recover for more. I've been training for a long time. I know I'll physically, I won't even get sore from this. And I can at least get sore for a day or two and you know, more volume is usually more growth. So I can get more growth. So fuck it, I'll add a set. But if I don't need a set, if I, I you know, it's week three and my pecs got destroyed again from three sets, fuck, I don't do three sets. What do I do that for? If I'm in mental sort of lockstep, lockstep pattern of really great workouts, some aided, I just fucking stay there. But I know it's unlikely that the first week is going to look like week three. And I know that maybe we can eke a little bit more out of that last week. So my volume ramping isn't a linear ramp. It's an auto-regulated ramp based on how are we recovering soreness-wise? How was the mind-muscle connection tension production? And how much is the pump? And how much, like, how much weakness do you experience in muscles after? Those, to me, are pretty decent proxies of a good hypertrophic stimulus. If you're checking the boxes, all you need to do is check the boxes. The volume could be the same. So maybe that's where James and I a little bit deviate is I'm for an auto-regulated paradigm, which often looks like a ramp, but not always. Sometimes it looks like a ramp and then a maintenance and then a mini ramp or not even a mini ramp. Uh, but I think that, you know, can you assume just a flat line for all of it? Yeah, but then you have to explain why you're getting so fucked up and stupid sore in the first week and why in the last week you could have really had a fucking great workout. You're like, man, says 10 sets. And someone could say, well, you're quite used to those 10 sets. Couldn't you recover from and benefit from 12 maybe? You're like, yeah, but the program says 10. Like, well, fuck, you know, like the body right now, so it's, it's almost like saying, you know, you're, you're hungrier for this meal and you have an open-ended macros. Why not eat more? The coach says I shouldn't eat more. Like, well, eat more now and then tell your coach, hey, like, I got even hungrier. Great news. I can gain more weight on massing now um, and maybe update the coach. So I would say it's my, my view is more of an auto-regulatory paradigm that doesn't claim to be categorically better than a, a flat paradigm. It just, it just shaves the edges off a little bit. It's like 
you know, the difference between pre-drinking for a party to get nice and toasty and, and the difference between, and, 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 you know, drinking that last shot and getting a ride home versus just showing up to the party and pounding the same total number of drinks, or like, you know, there may be like a little bit different of a peak of when you're having fun. So like, if you start drinking at a party, you have to like fuck around with the people you hate sober. And for at least half an hour, that's bullshit. You know, we've all been there. And, uh, you know, so if you could pre-drink, ramp into it, you'll have a great time and you leave it a great time. How much better of a time is that? Not much, maybe I say five, 10, 20%, something you can only really detect on advanced, intermediate, and advanced individuals with very well-designed research studies. Like Meadow said, zero of those studies actually exist on anyone. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't catch them. But you know, if I'm just using as logical approach as I can figure out, I'm going to auto-regulate a little. I'm never going to do a flat program just, just because an average volume, yeah, it's going to be the same. And by the way, volume ramping for myself, and I think for James, looks like this. And then the next mesocycle, it's not like we're like, well, we finished at 40 sets last meso. It's got to be 45 this time. No, it's not. You start where roughly you think it's good, and then you see where it takes you. So for me, my mesos go from like 10 to 20 sets, and then 10 to 20, and then 11 to 21, and then I deload, and then I'm so much stronger than I was at the beginning of that process. Now each set is more effective. I might actually do less volume in future mesocycles, but I still do that ramping style, and I'm open-minded to the fact that sometimes you need more volume and sometimes you need less based on the conditions presented at the very moment. Yeah, I'd say that that's uh, the first part is, is very much in line with what I do, and I'm also a big fan of auto-regulating. I probably go by more objective metrics. Like I'm, I'm big on work capacity. For example, and of course, progression itself is, I think, is always the most important variable. Uh, and then I just spend more time trying to lock in the perfect volume in the long term and staying there. So the first part is actually the same. It's uh, probably more different in practice because if you come from deloads more often, then you're going to do the initial ramp more often. And if you don't, then you're going to stay at the sort of the average more long term. But uh, the additional part and the, the key of finding a sweet spot. Is very much aligned with um, what I recommend. Awesome. One, one, sorry, one quick thing. I think James can probably speak to this more because this is a study I found out through him. There's at least one study that shows that folks that did, I think, like three individual ramps with like two weeks off in between each one gained the same amount of total muscle as people that were training actually the entire time which you can pick apart that study on a variety of methodological grounds, but I think it at least illustrates that there's some way to construct a paradigm in which you actually do like roughly two thirds of the total work, but based on the fact that the body loses muscle much more difficultly than it gains it, you can actually do less work and get the same results at least, which at least from a long-term perspective of keeping your body together to accomplish big goals is maybe a better idea than just pushing uh, the pace all the time. I don't know if J James, you wanna speak to that that study or if there are other studies like it since then. Uh, yeah, I mean, um... You know, that was that study was done a, a fair number of years ago, but yeah, they took three week periods completely off, like no training at all. Um, and then they just went back to the training program that they were doing. And by the end of the study, both groups had gained the same amount of muscle. Now it was untrained subjects, so you know, there's that caveat there. Um, but you know, to me, it was just a little bit fascinating. I mean, I would I'd, I'd love to see something where you'd you know, rather than taking three weeks completely off, what if you had three week, like really low volume periods, you know, would the overall effect be the same? Would it be different? I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of this stuff is so hypothetical, you know, because again, there's, there's not a lot of studies on this stuff. And, and even of the little research you have, you know, there's limitations and things like that. I mean, I'm, I also want to clarify where I am. I'm very much auto-regulatory in terms of volume, at least now, just in the sense of, you know, probably not as rapid increases in volume. Not saying that, that Mike's increases are really fast, but not as fast as, as uh, I'm, probably, I'm probably a little bit more closer to men. Basically, I just use progression as, as a signal whether to increase volume or not. So, I mean, if someone's gaining on a certain volume, for 10 weeks, there's no reason to change. The, there's no reason to increase. The, there's no reason to change the volume. So I would keep the volume there until they finally hit a plateau. And they were like, okay, let's try bumping the volume up. See if that stimulates more progress. If it doesn't, I might try bumping the volume up again. And if, you know, if a couple successive attempts to increase volume don't stimulate further progress. So it's, it's very auto-regulatory. Then I'm like, okay, well, I can't, 
I'm not going to just keep adding more sets. Obviously, I got to change something. So that's where I'd probably, you know, bring volume back down, maybe change exercises. I don't know. Um, but uh, um, I, I'll, I will say, and this is purely anecdotal, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, you know, I've been, you know, lifting weights since I was 1920. Um, and, uh, you know, since I'm, the year 1920. Yes. Yes. <laughs> like, hey, dude, I'm like Captain America, dude. I'm like, that's how old I am. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm 47 now. And so it, it was inter really interesting that the pandemic was a very good experiment for me. So when the pandemic first hit, you know, my gym closed down. I don't have home gym equipment. And, um, um, and I wasn't, and, you know, home gym equipment had become so fucking expensive. I wasn't going to buy some. And I hate just doing push-ups and stuff all the time. Like, it's just like, I can't just be doing a gazillion push-ups each day. I just like, I'm just, you know, so I decided, you know what, you know, I've, I had some nagging injuries and things like that. You know what? I'm just not going to lift. I'm not going to do anything. Maybe I'll go for walks. I just did nothing for like probably the longest time off of training I'd ever had since I was 20 years old. Like this was probably a good three months, at least a three, four month period. Finally, my gym opens back up. I go back in and I start super low volume, literally one set per exercise, two exercises per body part. That was it. And I, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to stay at that volume until I hit a plateau. And then I'm going to bump the volume up. You know, I'll just add like one set, you know, if I hit a plateau. And so I did that. And what was interesting is after a period of wasn't very long. I want to say like three months or so of doing that. I literally hit personal bests on some at 47 years old. I hit personal bests on some of my exercises and I did it on like half of the volume that I've been doing in the past, you know, which I thought was really fascinating to me. So, um, you know, I, I, again, per, purely anecdotal experience. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think it, it, it does speak to that no matter where you're at in your training, um, I think your volume needs, you know, could shift over time, could vary over time, depending on, you know, like I said, I totally let myself detrain. Um, now, obviously I wasn't doing, I don't have ultrasound. I'm not doing individual measurements of muscle size. I have no idea if I actually gained, all I know is that my actual performance on the exercises that hit personal best. So that's all I know. But, um, Anyway, I just thought it was kind of a fascinating experiment, experiment with myself of doing this kind of slow volume ramp, just using, per, using my plateaus as a signal to whether to increase my volume or not. Um, so, If I'm understanding correctly, James, you just said that because you hit all-time bests as a result of the pandemic, the COVID-19 global pandemic was a good thing that you liked? <laughs> well, it, that's, it, when all, that's what I'm hearing, buddy. <laughs> No, I wouldn't say that I liked it, but Steve, uh, you have these kinds of people on your channel. I mean, this is ridiculous. <laughs> that's basically how woke people are you. <laughs> yeah, that's how woke he is. And Menno, if you heard, James was like my my experiment with COVID-19. Uh, James, did you engineer the COVID-19 virus so that you could have a detraining study on yourself? It, it was all for my games, man. <laughs> it's worth it, bro. It was worth it. Yeah, you just have to add that he's also racist, and then it's basically the standard woke argument. Boom, canceled. Get out of here. Ma massive, <laughs> massive straw man, therefore racist. <laughs> what do I win? In any case, I, um, I oh, think sorry. those two, there's um, uh, the, the study Mike mentioned. There are two of them. I think it's good to, to add some points to that, because they are, they are very interesting studies. And taken at face value, they would indeed show that Oh, you can just take a few times off training and you get the same results. Um, as, as James mentioned, both were in rank untrained individuals. And that is a very, very important point because if an untrained individual takes some time off training, then almost nothing happens because, I mean, they were untrained, they're still untrained, you know. But if you're very advanced, we see in some studies that in most studies, in, in about two weeks, there's measurable loss of strength and size. And, um, Can I say something real quick, Meno? How, how would you respond to the point where they are, because they're untrained, 
if they're taking two or three week chunks out of the program, they're missing vast quantities of their most fertile new gains. So like the counterpoint to that you see is like, gee, that's a big deal. Because if it were advanced, we could say, well, advanced people barely progress anyway. So taking two or three weeks out here and there, whatever, they're going to be the same either way. But with noobs, it's like a huge fraction. I mean, they literally did like what, half the work or something or a, th a third less work. I mean, that's a lot of missed noob gains. And it's also shown that noobs, yeah, they don't, when they gain, they, they actually lose pretty quickly. Uh, it, it, it doesn't just hang in there with where the advanced people, they do have a recession after two weeks, but then they tend to lose really slowly after that. So can you speak to that a little bit? Just just uh, speaking my mind here freely. Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with untrained individuals, it's always tricky because there's two factors that muddy the waters. Um, and one of them is that there's, um, or one is that they have a huge potential for growth. And typically that's good because it increases statistical power in research. So we see that they can, you know, what makes a small difference to them is actually uh, a detectable difference. Whereas 5% greater gains in an advanced individual, you can't measure it because it's 5% of a very small number. However, another factor is that there seems to be a significant ceiling effect of gains in untrained individuals. So significant to the extent that I think one review, I think you, you actually discussed this once, which uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's the first time I heard about it when you discussed it. Uh, the, the review found that aerobic exercise and strength training actually result in the same amount of muscle growth because they only looked at, stud, or pretty much only looked at studies in completely untrained individuals. And then you see that if you go from, you start just doing anything, you actually make a significant amount of gains. And for the first little period, it doesn't even matter if you're doing strength training or bicycling or whatever, you're, you're just doing something and the muscle's gonna grow and it's pretty much gonna grow maximally very quickly. So that's, that's a great the other point. factor you're gonna, and that's why we see in untrained individuals, many studies on training volume, they don't find differences between individuals. So higher versus lower. Because they're peaked out anyway, right? Exactly, so they just max out. And basically this whole study, in a way, um, one was 15 weeks, I think, and one was six months. So six months is pretty good, but 15 weeks is complete untrained uh, level. And in that study, I think non-significantly, the continuous training group did actually make better progress on almost every marker, but it wasn't statistically significant. And the other study was almost identical gains. So that, that's a more uh, interesting study, but still within six months, basically the studies found that in six months, you can make a certain amount of gains, gains at volume X, or at about 75% of volume X. Well, there's lots of research showing that in untrained individuals, that is the case. You know, so if you if you look at the study that way, it might just mean, well, untrained individuals, they can they can miss workouts, they can do high volume, they can do low volume, as long as they're putting in half decent effort and they're pretty consistent in the time that they do go to the gym, at least in these studies, they're gonna make a certain amount of gains. And it's quite hard to, to even optimize that within the very first stage of training. So I'm, I'm I'm pretty skeptical of that study taking it to mean that you know you can take weeks off and those resensitize you because I think also they they looked at the initial period of gains at least in one of those studies and it wasn't like the initial gains after the the deloads which were just complete time off they didn't have any volume ramping it was just flat program nothing flat program I think those were not significantly different from the phase before either which is in contrast to itself, right? Because the study is saying that, well, you get the same end result, but you're not gaining faster after the time off, but you are missing a period of gains. So you usually see that in studies where statistical power is simply a problem or you have massive ceiling effects. So based on that being in completely untrained individuals, I'm very skeptical to read much into that. Uh, I will say that those are, are super interesting and I'd love to see that in well-trained individuals. And then specifically measuring also the progress after the deload compared to before. I think mechanistically, I have a very hard time seeing how there could be um, an anabolic rebound, basically, based on the other research that you know supercompensation during deload weeks after overreaching also doesn't really seem to occur. We know that muscle memory is real. We know that there are diminishing returns to training volume and training um, continuing to train over time. Like the more advanced you get, the slower you gain. So those factors all are very real. Um, 
but I can't really see a mechanistic effect that would explain why after time off, you would gain better. Like we know that if you lost some muscle, for example, there's the, the uh, myonuclei are still there, levels of muscular activation are higher still than before. So those factors can potentiate the regaining of the lost muscle, but I don't see how they would potentiate gaining more muscle. Steve, can I share a thought on that real quick? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, Meadow, those are, those are very good points. Um, I'm also maybe a little bit skeptical. Uh, I'll put it this way. I'm not entirely confident that uh, taking time away from training or very low volume training can actually lead to better overall gains in the, in the future, like within a year versus just training continuously. What I can say is I think that the human body regains muscle so fast um, and doesn't lose much to begin with uh, in, in this, it's at least several weeks of um, not no training and certainly four weeks of lower training, maybe no muscle loss occurs then at all, where what ends up happening is because you're taking those periodic breaks, your overall total exposure to cumulative fatigue for about a year of training can be significantly lower. And because fatigue interferes with so much of the training process, maybe that's the way in which that occurs. So whether or not you deload reactively or proactively or some combination, I think that the deloads, however long they are in any one stretch, and if they're longer in one stretch, you have to take fewer of them. If they're shorter in one stretch, you have to take more, generally with the same fatigue in position. Then it brings down the fatigue of the program overall. So within like a 12 or 16 week run, I don't think it matters much because fatigue only gets super psychotically high towards the end of that if you don't deload, which actually brings me to the thought of how some of these programs pass IRB when there's a 20 week program of continual insanity and you're like zero attempt made to deload. Like if I was on that IRB commission, I'd be like, oh, you can't do this to people. Are you guys crazy? But in any case, um, if that fatigue reduction is the only thing that's really been, uh, really is happening, I think the fatigue reduction can make the training so much more productive and less injurious that overall there's a slight margin beneficial to taking a few more breaks than you maybe have inclined to do just on pure autoregulatory at the time of the situation performance. I, I, and something interesting for viewers to think about is that almost to a T, every elite athletic resistance development program in the world, almost every Olympic weightlifting team, almost every serious sports team that trains with weights, they actually um, program a considerable amount of active rest and fatigue management with lower and higher volume uh, approaches and take an unbelievably high amount of time off uh, with, it's not that their athletes are derelict, it's that their coaches tell them to do this and they didn't always used to. And I'll further say like, so for example, the Soviet weightlifting teams, uh, you know, I've hung out with a lot of Russian lifters and they're all much better educated on average in sports science than American lifters. It's changing now, but uh, it used to be like this at least uh, five or 10 years ago. And a lot of these guys, after they you know win world championships or whatever, they'll like, just go to Europe, uh, you know Western Europe, uh, with their with their ponytails or um, other strange haircuts and their fanny packs and capri pants. That's that's cool Eastern European way to dress. And they just walk around Eastern Europe for a month and just go to clubs and have fun and eat food. And they don't even lift weights. And then to them, you know, you could ask like, what the hell is right? Like, I've been to powerlifting meets where these guys were invited to do exhibition lifts. And nobody really told them that people are there only to see their best lifts. And they all showed up like two, 300, 400 kilos less in their total for the three lifts powerlifting than people come to expect. And these guys look half the size. They like, what the hell's going on? Well, one thing is, you know, clearly they're just using few or no drugs at all. But also that sport culture that developed there was one of you, you take a big peak uh, to whatever present your best. And then you take kind of plenty of time away. This is also seen in American bodybuilding where it's, it's very uncharacteristic for top bodybuilding champions to just go hard all the time. Guys will go easy for significant periods of time. And that seems to be kind of the received wisdom. And the, the reason it's curious to me is because it goes against most of the wisdom in bodybuilding and powerlifting, et cetera, of just fucking go hard all the time. Because it's kind of the obvious thing. If you didn't know any better, you'd be like, just fucking hard all the time. If you need a break, take one, but then just go back in, in, in. Versus we have guys at the higher level taking really quite quite impressive amounts of time off and seemingly still being the best of their sport. I don't know if it's because it's because they're being pushed too hard. I think maybe that is sort of indicative of something really good happening there. And I'll also say that when programs like East Germany's, Soviet Union's, um, China, when they all program pretty extensive active rest, uh, again, not total time off, active rest, and sometimes some good total time off as well, several weeks or a month. Um, I, I, I don't 
automatically think it's because they're being easy on their athletes. I mean, these people would toast their athletes. If you know, the athletes died shortly after winning the Olympics, they wouldn't change anything about their program. If that, that netted 5% more gold medals, they would just approve it right away because human rights don't exist in those places. But for some reason, even in places with no human rights, they're giving their athletes a lot of time off. Maybe that's because they have found that that works uh, better because of that sort of uh, cumulative fatigue thing. And that at some point, because muscle gains become so resistant, you get roughly the same result from just going away from it for a while and then coming back versus just keep pounding. But the keep pounding has a net fatigue cost for the year training, of course, but also for a career. So the folks that move away from hard training all the time, maybe just last longer, and then their eventual peak is higher. Uh, what, what do you guys think about that? Like, uh, it's always... Uh, is always curious to me why countries that want to win at all costs don't just train their athletes all the fucking time. Yeah. Well, I'm, I don't have data on this. I know that a lot of teams do uh, just train the crap out of them all the time. And with athletes, you have in-season and off-season. There's also a lot of athletes where it, it's, it's definitely not a wisdom aspect. I mean, if you even at the Olympics... So many athletes still use cocaine, drugs, like even the night before a competition, they go drinking. Like the level of dedication in, in athletes in uh, most sports is an absolute joke compared to even a local bodybuilding competition. Agreed. Like that, that sounds, that sounds uh, controversial, but if you, if you know even a, a small number of, of athletes, of bodybuilders, it's a uh, it's completely different level. Like a bodybuilding show, the effort it takes with your nutrition, and also not just showing up twice a day to, you know, to haul ass for four hours a day, but also your nutrition, your lifestyle, everything. And then for pro bodybuilders, on top of that, meticulous drug usage, uh, which is actually also very difficult and requires a lot of discipline and et cetera. It's, it's a completely different uh, ball game, no pun intended. So, eh, I'm, I mean, I would like to see data on that. If, uh, um, if teams that program rest, for example, are more successful, um, I'm just always very wary of reading anything into these things. Also, I've, I've coached a few of those kind of athletes I've uh, coached and the, the time off periods are, are not so much planned in, in many of them. Like either Sometimes, they're just yeah. injured or they, um, or it's just the drugs, like side effects from the drugs that they have to stop. Uh, or they're, they're really not that dedicated. Actually, in my, my experience, yeah. yeah, my experience, there's an inverse correlation between, uh, genetic potential and, uh, dedication the most dedicated people i've seen are some of the the worst hard gainers that there are and i've seen some of the most horrendous work ethics in clients that i thought were damn if only you had the work ethic of someone else you would be winning world medals and then for them sometimes they still win national medals you know so they go on <laughs> for example i've had uh, i won't name names but i've got some high level powerlifters that took a holiday, planned a holiday two weeks before their meet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just a two-week holiday where they didn't do any training, didn't pay attention to their diet, and still scored very impressive results. Uh, but then on the other end, those people are also have a... When they go all in, they, they really go all in. So I've also had one very high-level powerlifter who um, he had basically a torn tendon in his shoulder, and he just trained through it for pretty much we we did as best we could during the training phase which was very limited training but he was so strong on the squat and deadlift in particular that even if he just put a half decent bench number in and he actually put a pretty good number in then he would get a really good result and win national medal and he did um but he, he pretty much messed up his shoulder uh, <laughs> really really badly for um months afterwards so that level of effort is also something that you see in those people that kind of compensates for the lackluster uh, work ethic at other times. Yeah, I agree with almost all that. James, do you have any thoughts to that? Yeah, I don't know. it's just it's kind of interesting because I mean, again, so much of this stuff is all kind of hypothetical and speculative that we, you know, um, you know, and that's the limitations with training research. I mean. The fact is that most training studies involve college students who are basically on a quarter or semester system. That's one of the reasons why studies only last like 12 weeks or something, you know, it's just, it's just one of the limitations. And so you're kind of left with these round tables where we're kind of speculating on things and, 
you know, and it could just be very well be that maybe in the long run, it doesn't really matter that much, you know, as long as you're somewhat, as long as you're reasonably consistent over time. And maybe some of these volume ramping and volume cycles are just ways, methods of just staying more consistent, you know, whether it's avoiding injury or just keeping interest. I mean, who knows, you know? Yeah. And so, um, uh, you know, it, it's, if anything, you know, it, it gives you ways to different ways, even just from a psychological perspective to change your training up, you know, I mean, because if you're someone who's been training for 20 years, you know, doubtful that you're using the exact same training program that you were 15, 20 years ago. Um, I think just mentally, like, like I wouldn't be able to stand that. Even if it was working, I think I would just get, I was like, I got to do something a little different here. Like I would just get sick of it, you know? So, um, so I, th I, I think that brings up, you also don't want to um, underestimate, I would say sometimes the psychological effects of some of these training manipulations, you know, beyond any, you know, whether there's physiological mechanisms or not, sometimes there just could be psychological things that, you know, whether it makes someone more motivated or get someone to be more consistent or whatever, you know? Um, so I think but, the but, very, sorry. Oh, no, but I was saying that, uh, I mean, the fact is, is like, we're kind of just, it's like, we're kind of nitpicking over details anyway. I mean, sure. like the three of us are all, I mean, if you were to step back and take a look at the big picture, we're not really that different, you no. know? Um, it's just like little details that we might differ in our, in our methods and it's all based, it's all speculative anyway, you know? So. Yeah. It's, it's singing true towards a sort of round table that I did with refeeds in that it's, we can't necessarily say they're kind of definitely better or worse and it might just be equivocal it might be personal preference yeah it's interesting you said about the psychology there because i think some people downplay potentially the upsides or even downsides of the psychology behind a refeed depending on the person yeah. so again it's one of those like do we end up if average calories are in the same place do we end up in the same place with or without refeeds or maybe diet breaks same with like rates of gain and using more frequent mini cuts versus longer massing periods. People will argue maybe it just ends up at the same place. And then I guess you take the individual into consideration and N equals one, like what results are you seeing with your clients and uh, what's happening in real time? And like you said, James, ultimately it all comes down to like a lot of consistent hard work. Yeah. As long as you're getting that in, you're probably seeing a lot of what you want to be seeing. So use some of these tools in your toolbox, however, deemed appropriate for that individual so i don't know if any of you guys have anything additionally to add to this kind of round table i mean I, I would say that um um we don't have to be too nihilistic about it if we look at commonalities for example we're all erring on the side of relatively higher training volumes and looking for ways to accommodate that you know we're, we're not uh high IET proponents um and we're also not on the side of absolutely crazy volumes um most all, all methods that we discuss involve auto-regulation and ways to regulate fatigue. I think none of us are big on board of active overreaching, like actual overreaching where you get weaker and potentially even lose size to get uh, crazy supercompensation afterwards. Um, so I think there, there are um, you know quite some commonalities. The, the variation we plan is also strategic or auto-regulated. Uh, and not completely random. And we do have at least two studies showing that basically random type, uh, both, I think one study on exercise selection, just randomly alternating in exercises, and one study randomly using some advanced training techniques from Damas et al., relatively recent. They found that uh, even though in the Damas study, they did on average higher volume, they, they made the same, so no better gains. So just variety, just for the sake of it, is also not something that's uh, beneficial. Um, so yeah, I think probably it's good to to emphasize those uh, the commonalities and uh, also what we're not doing, and then uh, yeah, and that there are still uh, big gaps uh, in the literature. And you're all getting results, which is great too. And I think actually importantly, you mentioned the similarities was when you, however you do decide to deload or back off, uh, reactive or not you're always kind of tapering back into the program 
which was something I definitely took away from like everyone does that kind of that intro initially because of the unwanted side effects that maybe going too hard too soon with too much volume would bring, which I think was a, a great take home, if any, from the whole discussion as well. Anything you wanted to add, Mike? I have one thing to say when we're not recording anymore, but I have done saying anything, but it's live. <laughs> awesome. You, Guys, you know, thank you, know you so much. That's when even Mike won't say it live. It's crazy, right? It must be real bad. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for taking the time. Hopefully the viewers have taken something away from this. And we'll catch you next time. Take care. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course. The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is gonna be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there, you can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. It's also gonna be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.